up. It's Tuesday. It's time what? for another board game video. What? What? It's Tuesday already? Oh, I was just having the strangest dream. I don't have time for that. Tell us about the game. All right, all right, all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to TripAdvisor. Apparently, it's Tuesday. It's time for another game. Jason Tripp here with my daughter, Michaela Tripp. Today, looking at the four to ten player game, When I Dream, in which someone assumes the role of a dreamer while others feed the dreamer information. So let me open the box. We'll take it to the table, take a look. I'll show you how it works, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, here's all the components of When I Dream outside of the box. So I'll just show you all the components, how the game sets up, and then we'll briefly walk through how the gameplay works. Uh, so the first thing you'll see in the box is this board. You'll want to put that down in the center of the table. You've got this uh, unique sort of bed that also goes in the center of the table. That fits nicely right into the board on the table. And then uh, you'll have... Uh, a bunch of cards, you'll place those cards inside the bed, you shuffle those up, place them in the bed, and just to show you an example of one of those cards, on each card you'll see some unique artwork, uh, sort of two pictures uh, blending into one. So in this card I've got actor and moon, uh, so you'll put all those on the bed, and then you'll take uh, the headboard, there's a headboard piece, and you'll cover up one side of the bed so only one of the two words is revealed. In this case, uh, we've got the word actor revealed. That means that side of the card will be the active word for every part of the game. So the bed fits nicely into the board. You've also got a number of these scoring tokens here in the shape of clouds, stars, and moons, uh, one, five, 10, and 20. And so you'll be collecting those as the game goes. So you'll just wanna keep those off to the side, sort of within reach of all players. Players. Lastly, you'll have these different roll cards in the game and depending on how many players are playing you'll distribute one of these cards to each player and they will look at it secretly not revealing the role they are assuming that round to the rest of the table. Uh, each player will get one of three rolls. Um, you can either be a fairy, a boogeyman, or a sandman. And aside from the dreamer who's wearing the sleep mask, all the other players in the game will assume one of those three roles. Depending on how many players are playing, uh, the fairies, the sandmen, and the boogeyman will be distributed in different ratios. Uh, there's a nice little chart in the setup portion of the rule book that tells you how many sandmen and fairies and boogeymen to be distributed. For example, in a seven player game, if we're playing a seven player game, it says we distribute three fairies, two boogeymen, and two sandmen. Of course, the dreamer will have one of those cards, but the dreamer will not know which card is in front of them and which card is out of play. And so how the game works is the player will put the sleep mask on, and then the next card will be taken out of the bed so the rest of the players can see the name on the card. And going clockwise around the table, they will give the dreamer a one-word clue. And the dreamer can listen to as many clues as he or she needs to, after which time he or she will guess what the word actually is. Now here's the catch. Anybody who's playing the role of the fairy wants to give true information to the dreamer. So in this case, if the word is actor, um, I might say performance, or I might say movies, or I might say Eastwood, uh, anything that will try and connect to the word actor. However, if I'm assuming the role of the boogeyman, my goal for that round is to give the dreamer false information, to get the dreamer to guess anything but the word actor. And so I might say anything from food to cold uh, to princess or anything that might lead the dreamer astray. If I'm a Sandman, the Sandman wants to see how the round is going because you've got, you know, this, I think it's a two minute timer here. And every time a word is guessed, the card is going to be taken. And on the board, see the board here on each side of the board there's a fairy side and a sandman side so if on the first word the dreamer correctly guesses actor that card will be placed on this side well the sandman 
might waffle between giving true and false information depending on how many cards are correct and incorrect. They want at the end of the round to be an equal or as close to equal number of cards on each side of the board. And so they need to sort of potentially switch roles to pretend to be a fairy or a sandman maybe in the same round. Um, at the end of the round, that is the first phase of the round. That is the night time when the dreamer is actually dreaming. Once the time runs out, the dreamer doesn't yet remove their mask. The dreamer then has to, it is morning time, and before the mask is removed, the dreamer has to, to the best of their knowledge and recollection, remember each and every part of their dream. And so let's say there were five cards guessed in that round. Actor, guitar, helmet, lollipop, and dragonfly. Uh, the dreamer might say, oh, last night I dreamt I was watching a movie and the actor in the movie was playing a guitar and the actor for some reason was wearing a helmet. Um, and uh, all of a sudden a dragonfly flew by and landed on the guitar. Maybe they, they, they tell a narrative or they tell what they dreamt about. If they are able to guess all of the correct guesses they made while they were dreaming, they get some bonus points. And so that's how the round works. Around the table it goes. As soon as uh, the dreamer is ready to make a guess, they guess. And for the next card, the next person, uh, in a clockwise order begins the clues of the next card that is in the bed that has been revealed. And the game continues in that fashion. Um, after one person has assumed the role of the dreamer, the next round, the person to their left becomes the dreamer. And the game continues in that fashion until everyone has had an opportunity to be the dreamer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how the scoring works at the end of each round. A uh, fairy, sandman, and boogeyman will get points accordingly depending on how well they accomplish their goals for that round. Remember, of course, as I mentioned, the fairies, let's start with them. Uh, the goal and the objective of the fairy is to get the dreamer to guess as many correct guesses as possible. So for an example, let's say the dreamer guessed six times and they have four cards correct on the fairy side of the board and they have two incorrect on the boogeyman side of the boards, the fairy would simply get four points because there have been four correct guesses in that round. Uh, likewise, the boogeyman would get two points because there were two incorrect guesses by the dreamer during the round. The Sandman scoring is a little bit different than the fairies and the boogeyman. Uh, as I mentioned, they want the piles, the correct and incorrect guesses to be as close or ideally equal. Uh, in this case, um, there are four correct and two incorrect. Had the piles been three and three, that would be ideal for the Sandman. They would get the number uh, in the piles, three plus two bonus points, they would get five. Uh, if there's a one card difference, so let's say there were four correct and three incorrect, they would get the, the point value of the greater pile. So in this case, they would get four because there's only a one card difference. Uh, if there were a two card difference, let's say there were five correct and three incorrect, um, they didn't do too well. So they would only get the points on the lower pile. In this case, they would get three. And so that's how the scoring works for the Sandman. It's laid out very clearly in the rule book. As mentioned, the game continues round and round. Everybody gets an opportunity to be the dreamer and the game ends when everybody's had the opportunity to be the dreamer. And at that point, uh, the player who has the most points collected throughout the game is deemed the winner. Okay, I want to just talk briefly before I give my final thoughts and my score for the game about some of the sort of house rules or some of the more obscure rules. Uh, because it is a party game and a guessing game, giving clues, um, typically there's always some questions and maybe a bit of confusion about what types of clues are valid and what types of clues are out of bounds. Uh, so as per the rule book, um, for example, if dragonfly is the clue, um, you cannot say dragon and you can't say fly, you can't say a part of the word, nor can you say rhyming words, uh, words that sound like. So if it's moon, one, you can't say soon, baboon, loon, uh, try and get them to guess the rhyming word. 
nor can you like give the word in another language. So if it's moon, I can't say loon. Um, you need to play in English language or a language of your choosing. This is the English version of the game. Uh, so those are a bit of the clues. If you do, in fact, um, give a clue that is out of bounds, um, you will be docked uh, one point from the game. Uh, also, it's imperative that whoever is the dreamer, they don't know how many they're getting right or wrong. Um, so you want to make sure that you very quietly slide the card after a guest slide it out of the bed and place it on the correct or the incorrect side of the board. It's also important that even though they can't see the roles you're playing, um, you don't uh, share your jubilation or your frustration after each guess. That will tend to give away what you are. If, if the person guesses correctly and you say bang the table or get frustrated, um, they will assume you are a boogeyman. And once once the dreamer knows you're a boogeyman or assume that, they're not going to tune you out. They're not going to listen to your clues. So that will really help you achieve your objective. So. And that's basically a when I dream in a nutshell. Let me give you a few of my final thoughts on the game. Okay, that's when I dream. A unique, fun little party game, four to ten players. Just give a few final thoughts about the game and uh, go through my report card as always for this game. First of all, let's talk about the theme. Uh, this theme is phenomenal. This is one of the more immersive games on my shelf. Um, I mean... You've got the, the mask on and the rolls. It really does have that feel that you are dreaming. Um, not only as you're listening to the clues and assume when you're the dreamer, but uh, waking up and trying to, to recall what you dreamt. Um, it, it's like real life. Sometimes it's a bit fuzzy. I know I had a dream, but I just can't put my finger on what I dreamt last night. Well, in the game, you'd be surprised. You think within two minutes, um, you'll remember what you dreamt about. But because you're focusing not only on trying to guess, but you're trying to focus on who is giving me true and false information when you're the dreamer, you'd be surprised how much like in real life it is kind of foggy and difficult to recall. And that's what makes the game a little more immersive and fun. There's always a, a good takeaway, a good story to tell from this game. So the theme is wonderful. I give the theme an A. Uh, the aesthetics. Um, Again, it's also one of the more beautiful games in my collection. Um, this bed, I mean, look at this. This is awesome. They've customized this bed so the cards fit right in it, right down to the details of the headboard covering one side of the board. Um, the artwork, too. Uh, the artwork is just phenomenal on each card. And, I mean, the quality is good. Uh, the artwork's phenomenal. You've got you know over a hundred cards here too, um, double sided. So basically, on each card, you have four possible things. And so the artwork's phenomenal. The, I mean, the sleep mask. This is genius. You're actually wearing a sleep mask. One downside is this can be a little tight if you got a large uh, large head like I do. Um, but it's great. The quality of the components is good. These tokens are great too. Fits the theme. I mean, you've got stars and full moon and crescent moons, clouds, and the artwork on the boogeymen and the fairy cards and the salmon cards is wonderful. Um, even the aesthetics, the artwork here and the rule book and the box, um, phenomenal. I give it an A plus for its aesthetic value. Replayability, uh, the game, as I mentioned, it's got so many cards in the game that you're not going to play it through three, four, five times and you're not going to see all the cards. You can get a lot of replay out of this game. Of course, it's not a game maybe you want to play every day. Well, you play it a few times and you pull it out. When you have the right crowd or in the right mood, like any party game, you need to have the right people around the table in the right mood. But it is a solid, replayable game, and I'll give it a B plus on its replayability. The game length itself, it says on the box it is 30 minutes, 30 plus. Of course, it is a party game, so depending on how many players around the table, the time length could vary. Uh, and the reality is it suggests that you play until everyone has assumed the role of the dreamer but if you're having so much fun playing the game there's nothing to say you can't play two rounds or play as long or as little as you'd like and so uh, the ease of play it seems like it's uh, or the game length excuse me it seems like it's uh, just the right length uh, and you can customize the length so I give it an A on game length uh, the ease of play it says uh, age 8 plus um, that might be stretching it for some. I play this with my children. They do quite well. 
Um, but again, any game that requires quick thinking and vocabulary, uh, you want to make sure that children are old enough and they understand it. They don't get frustrated uh, because, too, it's time sensitive. The one frustrating part of the game can be if someone is sort of taking too long to give their clue. It really makes the, the dreamer suffer because maybe half the time is while well, one person is waiting to give the clue. So you got to, I find you got to, you got to be thinking ahead to what you want to say uh, before it's your turn so when it gets to you you can give quick sort of shotgun clues to the dreamer uh, so that's the only little hiccup but uh, it is an easy game to learn and it's easy to pick up uh, so i'll give it an e a b plus on ease of play uh, tactics and strategy uh, some party games there's not a lot of thinking involved and this one is not overly difficult but there are some very real tactics and strategy um, if you're not the dreamer the cards are dealt out. You know your role, but you don't know anybody's role around the table. But after a, flu, a few clues are given, you'll pick up very quickly uh, who the fairies are and who the boogeymen are. Uh, a little more difficult to discern the sandmen because they can sort of change hats. But if I'm a boogeyman and I hear somebody else give a false clue, um, I may want to give a clue that is similar, that relates um, and that, that, that's one of the tactics and strategies we've found. If you, if you give a clue that's way out in left field, doesn't relate to anybody's clues around the table, uh, the dreamer's going to pick up right away that you're the boogeyman. And for the rest of that round, they're just going to tune you out. And that's really going to work against you getting your objective. But if the boogeyman can sort of, without telling each other, because you can't do that, if they can pick up based on similar clues, who are their allies, you can kind of play off each other. And there's some tactics and strategy there to try and trick the dreamer into thinking you are all fairies when in fact you are all boogeymen. And so there are some tactics and strategy involved in that, especially playing the role of the boogeyman and the sandman too. You know, when to, when to team up with the fairies, when to team up with the boogeyman to try and keep that balance. And uh, certainly as the dreamer, the, the tactic is just to try and try. You're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to remember what you guessed, but you're also trying to discern, okay, who are the people that are giving me true information? Who are the people that are giving me false information? And if you're quite sure they're giving you false information, you want to tune them out. So you got to be thinking quick as the dreamer, as well as the clue givers. And so there's quite a bit of tactics and strategy involved. I'll give it a B plus as well for the tactics and strategy. So overall, uh, I'll give the game an A minus. This is one of my favorite party games on my shelf. It's one that hits the table often when we're in the mood for a party game. It's also one we introduce to friends or family. It's one we can pull out if you've got people that aren't really into big heavier strategy games, but you want to teach them something beyond Scrabble or Monopoly, this might be one you want to look into. It plays four to ten players, so there's some flexibility there. Phenomenal game, When I Dream. Well, before I wrap up, just uh, one final important comment I want to make about this game and other games like this. Uh, the reality is that uh, board games are entertaining. They're a lot of fun to take out of the box, to explore a new game, to revisit a game. There's some good stories to tell. But there are some games, and this is one of those games, that even after you clean it up and you put it back on the shelf, uh, it can lead to some meaningful conversation. And this has been the case with this game. In particular, we're in the month of February now, in the midst of Black History Month. And uh, I'm thinking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I have a dream speech as I've been reflecting this Black History Month. And so, you know, this game here, and this has been the case in our family, sometimes, you know, after we finish playing the game, we can put it away and we can actually be talking afterwards about, you know, what what are you dreaming about these days? What are the dreams in your heart, in your life? What are is our family dreaming about for our community, for our workplace, for our school, for our world? And so, um, there are some intangible benefits to a game like this that even go beyond the time it's outside the box on the table. So I want to encourage all of you, keep playing games, keep enjoying them, but let's keep dreaming. Let's keep dreaming and working towards equality and justice for all people in our world, especially during this Black History Month we find ourselves in. So that's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining me at the table again for another tabletop board game review. I'm Jason Tripp. This is Trip Advisor. As always, you're welcome to like uh, like this video. You can share it widely with friends and family. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. And make sure you get notified of all future Tabletop Tuesday videos I produce, as well as Theology Thursday and Film Friday videos. So whatever's coming out of the box on your table this day and this week, I hope you have a wonderful time. Game on and dream on. Thank you.